Well, first of all, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ann Stoller, those of you who don't know me. There are 60 of you who have seen me too much already, and I congratulate you for being here since 9 o'clock this morning. And um, being in such an intensive space in this new Institute for Critical Social Theory. But it's my pleasure today to um, introduce a really dear friend and colleague at New School for Social Research, Simon Critchley, this evening, who launches for us the first of the public lectures uh, for this new institute um, that just began last night. Um, that, that's how utterly new we are. Um, I'm just going to mention the other two. In this same room, on Wednesday and Friday, Wednesday will be a, um, the second public lecture by um, Professor Patricia Williams from Columbia Law School, um, entitled The Anatomy of Short Lives, a Meditation on the Repetitions of Regret. And on Friday, by Professor Talal Assad um, from CUNY, Exploring Secularism, at the same time at 6 p.m. Um, so, Simon is one of the three faculty um, giving this set of master classes at the Institute, and his own, this starting today, has been on Heidegger and will be throughout the week. But to imagine Simon Critchley as an eminent philosopher of Heidegger would be to do injustice to the prolific, productive, and capacious quality of his thinking and writing. It would not capture the genres in which he writes and performs, the unique nature of the questions he's willing to pose, the non-traditional spaces for thinking philosophically into which he ventures. Trained in philosophy at the University of Essex and the University of Nice in 1987, yeah, got that right, he has since become the embodiment of the radical philosopher bringing both wisdom with a smirk, humor as critique, and wit as provocation to the center of his work. He's the author of 15 books that begin with Levinas and Derrida, move through an introduction to continental philosophy, ethics, dead philosophers, Shakespeare's prose in Hamlet, David Bowie's Poetics and His Own, Experimental Fiction, and he serves as the intellectual impresario of the Stone Blog at the New York Times. Simon is a philosopher of the world and in it, drawing the everyday and its extremes to the center of his thinking, refusing the conventions that hold analytic and continental philosophy apart. He reminds us with each of his moves from record album to an exegesis of Wallace Stevens' poetry, from introductory seminars on Heidegger for an overflowing audience of hundreds, that philosophy not only commences with disappointment, as he likes to put it, but with a refusal to abide by the conventions of what it should look like in form and content, where it resides, and for whom it should be. Tonight we hear Simon on one of his favorite subjects, suicide, death. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Ann. That's very kind. Um, <clears throat> this is, um, I wrote a Kindle single, <laughs> and it's going to come out next Monday, funnily enough, uh, it's called Suicide. Uh, this book talk is not a suicide note. This book is not a suicide note. 
Two years after Jean Amery's On Suicide was published in 1976, the author took his life. Ten days after Edouard Levé completed the manuscript of Suicide in 2007, he killed himself. In 1960, some 18 years after Albert Camus had raised and he thought resolved the question of suicide in the myth of Sisyphus, he was killed in a car accident. He is later to have said that dying in a car crash is the most absurd of all deaths. Camus has an unused train ticket in his pocket, always a much safer form of travel. There's space down here if you want to stand up. There's, there's lots of, if you want to come down. Let me say at the outset, at the risk of disappointing the listener, that I have no plans to kill myself just yet. <laughs> but who knows what fortune or fate might have in store. Nor do I wish to join the chorus of those who proclaim loudly against suicide and claim that the act of taking one's life is irresponsible and selfish, even shameful and cowardly, namely that people must stay alive whatever the cost. Suicide, in my view, is not an offence, either legally or morally, and should not be seen as such. My intention here is to give a description, maybe a defence of suicide, in the sense of simply trying to understand the phenomenon, the act itself, what precedes it and what follows thereafter, if anything. I want to look at suicide closely, carefully, and perhaps a little coldly, without immediately leaping to judgments, asserting moral principles like the right to life, or death, or duties, or something in between rights and duties. We have to look suicide in the face. Is this fading in and out a little bit? A little bit, yeah. Sure, OK. If I stand still, then. <laughs> <coughs> I don't like the moving around thing. We have to look suicide. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. If I go here, it's better, right? Yeah. OK, I'll go here. We have to look suicide in the face, long and hard, and see what features, what profile, what inherited character traits and wrinkles emerge. Perhaps what we see when we look closely is our own distorted reflection staring back at us. What qualifies me for this task? Absolutely nothing. I have no ex expert knowledge or esoteric wisdom to pass on. My way into the phenomenon of suicide borrows two words from Jean Amery, introspection and empathy. Rather than look at the claims and counterclaims about suicide in terms of some impersonal, impersonal social calculus with a view to legal liability. I mean, I've done some research on that, the sociology of suicide and the legal questions around suicide, which in our days turns around questions of legitimate medical procedures and so on and so forth, accompanied death, assisted suicide and the rest. I want to consider suicide in terms of our reflective capacity to think about the act and to put ourselves in the shoes or the head of those who have made that leap or have come close to it. Perhaps we might find that the capacity or potentiality, potentiality for suicide is what picks us out as humans. Of course, judging, of course, regardless of his answer, the question that Camus raised in the myth of Sisyphus is the right question. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. Should I live or should I die? To be or not to be? As we'll see, I won't go into this, I'll explain it, but as we'll I'll mention, the legal and moral framework that still shapes our thinking and judgment about suicide is hostage to a Christian metaphysics. A Christian metaphysics that declares that life is a gift of God, and therefore to take your own life is wrong. Although scripture nowhere explicitly forbids suicide, and of course Christ's crucifixion might be interpreted as a quasi-suicidal act. In killing oneself, it's claimed by Christian theologians, one is assuming a power over one's existence that only God should possess. Therefore, suicide is a sin. And I'll say a couple more words about that in a, a few minutes. 
From the 19th century onwards, this theological discourse was replaced by the rise of psychiatry, where suicide was not declared a sin, but was seen as a mental disorder requiring treatment of various kinds. And this is still largely how we approach suicide. We speak readily and not wrongly, not wrongly, of suicidal depression as an illness, best approached through a combination of drugs, lithium, say, and psychotherapy. For example, see K. Redfield Jameson's work on, on that, on Quiet Mind and elsewhere. But the implicit moral judgment on suicide that comes down to us from Christian theology remains intact and in force. Even when society or the state has taken the place of God, even when suicide is decriminalized, as it has been in the West for the past half century, though suicide is still illegal in many countries, especially in the Islamic world, it is still regarded as a kind of failing that invites an embarrassed response. We think that suicide is sad or wrong, often without knowing why. And we don't know what to say <coughs> other than mouth a few empty platitudes. We lack a language for thinking honestly about suicide because we find the topic so hard to think about, at once deeply unpleasant and gruesomely compelling. My hope here is to emit one or two grunts, maybe even a few syllables, that might take us on the way to such a language. When someone ends their life, whether a friend, a family member, or even a celebrity whom we identify with, think about the confused reactions to the deaths of Robin Williams and Philip Seymour Hoffman over the past year or so. But I suspect that we can identify stories which exert a similar effect in every year. But when we, someone we know or identify with dies, kills themselves, one of two reactions habitually follow. We either quietly think they were being foolish, selfish, and irresponsible, or we decide that their actions were caused by factors outside of their control, severe depression, chronic addiction, and so on. That is, if they acted freely in killing themselves, we implicitly condemn them. But if we declare that their actions were constrained by uncontrollable behavioral factors like depression, we remove their freedom. And against that tendency, I want to open up a space for thinking about suicide as a free act that should not be morally reproached or quietly condemned. Suicide needs to be understood and we desperately need a more grown up, more forgiving and reflective discussion of the topic. Too often, the entire debate about suicide is dominated by rage, a completely understandable rage. Whether surviving spouses, families and friends of someone who's committed suicide be any attempt to discuss suicide with an explicit or implicit, how dare you, Mr. Philosopher. But we have to dare, we have to speak. Alongside the rage of the survivors, there is what appears to be a contradiction in our reaction to suicide. On the one hand, its horror silences us, and we seem to find ourselves dumbfounded when a friend kills themselves. We might mutter to no one in particular, how could he have done it? What must his wife be going through? She just went out shopping, right? Weren't the kids in the house at the time? How exactly did he hang himself in his office? But it's unclear, even as, you run, even as you run through these questions in our heads, why we're doing it. Are we looking for some explanation, some excuse, or perhaps some kind of relief that allows us to differentiate ourselves from the person who killed themselves? Does it make us feel better? And if it does, should it? Think about the following scenario, which happened to me recently. After dinner, and a couple of drinks, an old friend of mine was telling me about the suicide of a close childhood friend, whom I didn't know at all. I sat there and watched my friend tell the story of the suicide at length, and related to other friends of his who had killed themselves over the past several years. I could feel his rising emotion, and it alarmed me. I knew that he'd been recently suffering with depression. He was becoming visibly upset. I listened intently, not wanting to appear disrespectful or flippant. I really wanted to help, but found myself either asking dumb questions or uttering banalities. 
Well, at least he's at peace now. It's as if our very proximity to suicide, the fact that our fate literally lies in our hands, which it does, is almost too much to bear, and words fail us. Our simultaneous nearness and distance from suicide silences us, or we change the topic of conversation. So what is Paul doing these days? So on the one hand, we're silenced by suicide. On the other hand, the theme of suicide makes us singularly voluble. I'm often asked socially, usually because people can think of nothing else to say, what I am working on. The question we all dread. <laughs> what am I writing? If I say the relation between the Sophia's the Sophie's Gorgias and Euripidean tragedy, or the spatial technologies of memory, or Heidegger's conception of the completion of metaphysics and its overcoming, I'm usually met with a polite, oh really, how interesting. That's usually felt followed by an awkward pause. If I say I'm writing a little treatise on suicide, then after an initial hesitation, or several hesitations, the floodgates open, and a tide of fascinating stories, opinions, and arguments flows forth. People begin to gush and recount stories of lives lost that could have been avoided. They speak of their friends' descent into the cold hell of depression, and maybe their own. They declaim happily about heroic and good deaths, and even more happily about the inverse, the comically risible demise, which invites a low, hollow laughter. They talk often indirectly of their own fear of death and the ways in which they've contemplated their end, or perhaps even attempted to bring it about. So suicide finds us both strangely reticent and unusually loquacious, lost for words and full of them. But any contradiction here is only apparent, not substantial. What we're facing here is an inhibition, a massive social, psychical, and existential blockage that hems us in and stops us thinking. We're either desperately curious about the nasty, intimate, dirty details of the last seconds of a suicide and seek out salacious stories whenever we can, or we can't look at all because the prospect is too frightening. Instead, we peek horror movie-like through the slits between our fingers with our hands on our face. Either way, we're hiding something, blocking something, concealing something in our silence or endless chatter, or indeed our rage. People don't throw away their lives lightly or willy-nilly. As David Hume said in his brilliant, short, posthumously published essay on suicide, he says, I believe that no man ever threw away life while it was worth keeping. And of course, the clause here that gives us pause is while it was worth keeping. What, in what conditions is or is not, is not life worth keeping? But Hume's point is that when life has become a burden that cannot be borne, one is justified in taking it. The question is one of the limits of forbearance, which are limits that should be understood reflectively and with compassion, with those two tools of amere, of empathy and introspection. And let me just say, I won't go into this now, there's some more stuff here which I'll skip over, but the question of suicide is not, you know, this isn't just an intellectual issue. Uh, this is something which obviously comes out of something else, but I won't go into that. Now the first part which I'll skip is the question of, um, and this is, you know, in the guise of a source of analytic philosopher, which I am not trying to go through the arguments about suicide, which usually turn in relation to questions of rights and duties. And I try and kind of pick through the arguments and pick apart the claims that are usually made. Now, the, um, as I mentioned before, the, the, um, the question of why suicide is firstly illegal, right? historically illegal, and there's stuff in here on Blackstone's commentary on English common law, where you can trace, as it were, the, the origins of the, uh, the prohibition against suicide, or morally prohibited, take us back to Christianity. 
And the argument is really quite specific. And again, you don't find it in scripture, you don't find it in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and the argument is as follows. It is that life is something of which we have use, but over which we do not have dominion. If we exercise dominion over our life, then we're assuming a power that only rightfully God can have. Therefore, to commit suicide is a sin. Right? So that's the argument. You find it in Augustine, you find it in Aquinas, and you find that refined over the centuries. And that is still, it's within that Christian theological framework that the legal and moral prohibition against suicide is still largely framed. And I, I look at how that argument is kind of picked apart by focusing on a... Pascal is gone. Is it gone? Is it back? Yeah, I'm doing If I go here, I'll try and go. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Radicati di Passerano. Anybody heard of Radicati di Passerano? Uh, an incredibly obscure Italian Piedmontese uh, thinker who wound up in London in the early 18th century who wrote a philosophical dissertation upon suicide in 1732. Uh, and he was blamed for a spate of suicides in London around that period and was um, uh, held, arrested and then escaped to the more tolerant United Provinces and Netherlands, converted to Protestantism and ended in misery some years later. But in that book, in that philosophical dissertation, um, he says, well, why is there a prohibition against suicide? And this is a very kind of uh, radical enlightenment story. Um, he, he takes it back to, he links it to the argument you can find in the treatise of the three impostors. Right? Le traité des trois imposteurs. And the three impostors are Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Right? We have no natural fear of death. Uh, Radicati insists. He takes a kind of Epicurean, Spinozist view of things. Therefore, the fear of death has been imposed on us by those malevolent men who've uh, prohibited against suicide. The three impostors, the founders of the three monotheisms. So that's the 18th century context for the debate. And from that, I then run into questions of uh, rights and duties in relationship to suicide and try and pick the arguments apart. Uh, people talk about you know, life as a gift, uh, which doesn't make any sense. Um, if you begin to look at it, you know, in relationship to God's love, because what you know, what kind of thing is a gift? If life is a gift, therefore you can commit suicide. Then what kind of thing is a gift? Right? A gift is something what you can't give back. A gift is something you can't refuse. A gift, by definition, is something if you're given it, you can take it to the goodwill store. You can trade it in for something else. A gift is not a commandment. Right? So there's a confusion about the idea of life as a gift. And it's like that with the various arguments around suicide. So I try to kind of unravel questions of rights, uh, get the prohibition against suicide, then rights for suicide, which are also confused because they depend upon an idea of the sovereign self. I then turn to the other side of the debate, which is duties. We have duties to keep ourselves alive to our loved ones, to our community, and so on and so forth. And I try and pick those apart as well questions of rationality of suicide, irrationality of suicide, and I kind of try and unravel that and, and sort of level the terrain a little bit so we can engage with the, the topic. And that's what I'd like to do now, by looking at a specific phenomenon. And that specific phenomenon I want to look at is the suicide note. And what kind of thing a suicide note is, which is a very interesting, strange genre. In May 2013, I organized a suicide note creative writing workshop. It was part of a two-week installation in a tiny space on Manhattan's West 21st Street called the School of Death that I curated with my friend Sina Najafi. The pop-up school came about as a rather sly and admittedly smart alecky reaction to the School of Life in London which retails a rather nauseating philosophy of self-help to the English upper middle classes in search of some vague notion of enlightenment. 
It was also intended as a way of poking a stick into the ever-growing ash pile of creative writing classes. <laughs> Despite the time of year, it was chilly and it rained constantly on a Saturday afternoon I was scheduled to run the class as a way of closing the show and putting an end to the school of death. To my surprise, 15 or so people turned up, <coughs> along with a journalist from the New York Times, who lurked awkwardly in the doorway. The glass doors of the huddle of the small space were open in order to allow people to spread out. Everyone was huddled in coats and jackets against the cold, and we sat on the floor. One always speaks to someone in a suicide note. So as suicide notes are attempts at communication, their last and usually desperate attempts at communication, final communications. They're also failed attempts in the sense that the writer is communicating a failure to communicate, expressing the desire to give up in one last attempt at expression. The suicidal person does not want to die alone, but wants to die with another or others to whom the note is addressed. The suicide note might have existed in, an, in antiquity. It's, it's unclear, perhaps even as far as ancient Egypt. But it rose to prominence in its recognizable modern form in the 18th century in England as a consequence of literacy and the rapid rise and spread of newspapers. The peculiar thing about the 18th century suicide note is the fact that they were routinely sent to the press by those intending to take their lives. The modern, suicide, the modern suicide note is in origin then a publication, an intensely public act, a perverse piece of publicity. The historical evidence might give us pause when we shroud the suicide note in secrecy, as we now tend to do, and consider it the sacrosanct domain of the spouse or family. Sometimes it is, but often it is not. So historically at least, the suicide note is an act of publicity, a publication. Indeed, the desire to keep the details of suicide secret is questionable. As everyone knows, the Golden Gate Bridge is a popular suicide destination. The, um, there was a competition. Ten people vied to be the 500th person to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, with one person even having the words 500 stenciled on their T-shirt. Yet all the suicides jump from the side of the bridge that faces San Francisco. No one wants to jump from the side that faces out to the Pacific Ocean. Peculiar, no? It is unless one accepts that suicide is often a public act, an act of publicity. This perhaps begins to explain the popularity of certain suicide locations like the Brooklyn Bridge, Beachy Head on the south coast of England, Toronto's Bloor Street Viaduct, or the now heavily securitized and fenced in bridges that span the gorges of Cornell University in upstate New York, a popular Ivy League suicide spot. The suicide note then is a form of display, the symptom of a deliberate exhibitionism. True for their readers, suicide notes are a kind of pornography. We're allowed to become voyeurs into a hidden and forbidden state of mind, and the notes exercise a kind of sick attraction. Right? It's a kind of sick pornographic aspect to the suicide note. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't look. We might learn something. It's also arguable that the exhibitionism, the exhibitionism of the suicide note is characteristic of the melancholic or depressed person. The odd thing about melancholics, which lest we forget includes many of us in a room like this, is that they don't keep quiet, but tend to proclaim endlessly and volubly about their misery. Of course, the paradigm case here is the suicidal Hamlet, who is not just content to feel profound grief at the murder of his father, and the hurried remarriage of his mother to his father's murderer, but who tells us about it in soliloquy after soliloquy. But what is most striking about Hamlet's speeches is not their delusional quality, but their perspicacity. What he complains about, the nature of grief, the futility of war, the illusory power of theatre, the obscurity of our parents' desire, especially our mothers, and most of all, our doubts about the nature of existence, are all powerfully true. The ceaseless self-accusations of the melancholic are very often accurate. What we see in Hamlet is a powerful cocktail of depression and exhibitionism, of introversion and theatrics. And of course, uh, Hamlet's first thought in Hamlet is the thought of suicide. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw into a Jew. Oh, that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. And Hamlet returns to that thought in the, in the play. But Hamlet 
submits himself to the theological, the Christian prohibition against suicide. Freud gives us the recipe for this cocktail of depression and exhibitionism with chilling clarity. Clarity in his brilliant play paper, Mourning and Melancholia from 1917. If mourning is the grief that we feel in response to the death of someone beloved that leads us to lament and plaint, then in melancholia, the object of this grief is no longer the dead beloved, but ourselves. What happens in depression for Freud is the self turns against itself. The subject makes itself into an object and complains bitterly. Why, what an ass am I, Hamlet says. In depression, the self sees itself ass backwards, as it were. And finding itself horribly wanting, finds itself horribly wanting and deficient. The self-sadistic urges flip over into a lacerating masochism, where we ceaselessly berate ourselves for our faults. In Freud's terms, the ego's narcissistic self-love becomes the basis for self-hatred. For Freud, this is the solution to the riddle of suicide, which makes melancholia so fascinating. We're compelled by Hamlet's endless staged antics and so dangerous. And Freud's argument has, argument has two steps. First, he says, Freud, so intense is the ego's self-love, which we have come to recognize as the primal state from which instinctual life proceeds. And so vast is the amount of narcissistic libido, which we see liberated in the fear that emerges as a threat to life, that we cannot conceive how the ego can consent to its own destruction. If we're motivated by self-love, if we're fundamentally narcissistic, if, as Freud says at the end of Instincts and Their Vicissitudes, hate is older than love, then how can we kill ourselves? This requires a second step. He goes on. The analysis of melancholy now shows that the ego can kill itself only if Owing to the return of object cathexis, it can treat itself as an object. If it is able to direct itself against itself, the hostility which relates to an object and which represents the ego's original re reaction to objects in the external world. Ignore the mumbo jumbo about object cathexis. Freud's point is crystal clear. Given our intense self love, in order to kill ourselves, we have to turn ourselves into objects. More precisely, we have to turn ourselves into objects that we hate. Thus, suicide is, strictly speaking, impossible. I cannot kill myself. What I kill is the hated object that I've become. I hate the thing that I am, and I want it to die. So suicide is homicide, on Freud's view. I think there's something powerful about that. And it's this idea of suicide as homicide that David Foster Wallace describes with great precision and pathos in the extraordinary commencement speech given at Kenyon College in 2005 called This is Water. He admits that it's a banality to say that the mind is a great servant but a terrible master. But nonetheless, it's true, he says. And this is the reason why, he goes on, people who commit suicide with firearms shoot themselves in the head rather than in the heart. They want to kill that terrible master. This is Freud's point. Suicide is the determination to rid ourselves of what enslaves us. The mind, the head, the brain, that vague area of febrile activity somewhere behind the eyes. What we sometimes call thinking. This also partially explains the phenomenon of suicide and its mixture of depression and exhibitionism, where self-love becomes hatred and one dies apologizing for one's actions. Before drowning himself in the, in the River Seine, the poet Paul Celan underlined the, underlined the following line from a biography. And the line he underlined was, sometimes this genius goes dark and sinks down into the bitter well of his heart. Through writing the suicide note, one turns oneself into an object, an object that is hated and must be drowned in a bitter well. A 50-year-old Massachusetts man wrote, I'm done with life, I'm no good, I'm dead. But there's a further, a further twist 
It's the dialectic of the suicide note. The hatred that permits us to overcome our self-love and kill ourselves is also the occasion for the most extreme exclamations of love. It's as though the intensity of self-hatred allows a final, heartfelt, and equally intense proclamation of love. These twin energies of love and hate dramatically pull apart and we fall into the abyss that opens up beneath us. The suicide note is the stage where the profound ambivalence of love and hate plays itself out. Kurt Cobain wrote more than one suicide note. On letter paper from a hotel in Rome in March 1994, he wrote, like Hamlet, I have to choose between life and death. I choose death. His final note from the 5th of April 1994 is powerfully revealing. He begins by expressing a yearning for the loving innocence of childhood. I'm too sensitive. I need to be slightly numb in order to regain the enthusiasm I had as a child. The ambivalence then swings around before swinging back, he says, this is Kurt Cobain. Since the age of seven, I've become hateful towards all humans in general. I'm too much of an erratic, moody baby. I don't have the passion anymore. And so remember, it's better to fade out, burn out, than fade away. Peace, love, and empathy, Kurt Cobain. At the foot of the page, Cobain writes in huge capital letters, I love you, I love you, I love you. It's that ambivalence that I'm trying to track here. And when Courtney Love, the great Courtney Love, first read out Cobain's note, she finished by saying to the crowd, just tell him he's a fucker, okay? <laughs> and that you love him. Just tell him he's a fucker and you love him. And it's that, again, that's the ambivalence of the response. The ambivalence of Cobain's suicide, note of love and hate, is captured precisely in love's hate. Courtney Love's hate. This is what uh, Jacques Lacan called enamoration, love hate, hate love. One of the most poignant suicide notes I know is simply this. This is, in many ways, this is, this is my thesis. This is the suicide note. Dear Betty, I hate you, love George. <laughs> Dear Betty, I hate you, love George. We die hating the one we loved and wanting to punish them with our death. There, see what you feel now. I bet you're going to love me now I'm no longer there. I bet you regret what you did now, didn't you, huh? I think it goes like that. Now, the ambivalence of love and hate finds expression in suicide. That's, that's the first thing I want to say. That suicide exhibits this extraordinary play between depression, exhibitionism, the ambivalence of um, hate and love. And it's that ambivalence that's being staged in the suicide note. It is the suicide note. And I want to push that a little bit further. The ambivalence of love and hate finds expression in suicide as a form of revenge. As retribution for a perceived injustice, a felt wrong. Euripides' her heroine, Medea, does not kill herself, but kills her two sons out of revenge for the wrong done to her by her husband. Theseus. Didn't wait for you once. There are many modern Medeas, not all of them women. In 2014, in Secunderabad in India, Dr. Aluru Dagavendra Guru Prasad, an assistant professor from a private business school with more than 30 authored and co authored scientific publications, killed his two sons before throwing himself in front of a train. He was apparently angry with his former wife, former wife for not being allowed to spend enough time with his sons. And this evening, I wrote this text in um, East Anglia in, in England, uh, there's a whole discussion of that, but I won't go into it. But in this evening, in East Anglia, on the local news, as I write these words, it was reported from Lowestoft, Suffolk, that a 35-year-old woman had killed her three children, placing their corpses in their beds, each daubed in lipstick with the words, I love you. She then drowned herself in the sea. The phenomenon of the re revenge suicide note can escalate into more political forms of self-killing. Uh, we think about that in relationship to suicide bombing. And or we think about that in relationship to, um, in famously, the protest against the war in Vietnam. A teacher in Saigon immolated herself in front of a pagoda with pictures of the Virgin Mary and the Buddhist, the Buddhist goddess of mercy by her side. Her note said the following, my intention, I wish to use my body as a torch to dissipate the darkness, to awaken love among men, and to bring peace to Vietnam. 
On December the 17th, 2010, Mohamed Bouazizi, a street vendor from Tunisia, immolated himself because of police harassment and ignited the conflagration of what some call the Arab Spring. He died from his injuries on January the 4th, 2011. We might think of these as cases of altruistic suicide, where one kills oneself in order to bring attention to a perceived injustice. There's a lot more we can talk about in relationship to that. Other surface motives appear in suicide notes. Adolf Hitler declared that my wife and I choose to die in order to escape the shame of overthrow and capitulation. Although I wonder whether if this might not be a case of Adolf turning to Ava Brown and saying, I'm going to kill myself, aren't we? <laughs> During the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War, Hermann Göring, founder of the Gestapo and Reichsmarschall of Germany, pointed himself out of pride when he heard that the Allies were going to hang him rather than shoot him. In Göring's worldview, being shot would have been a more noble and fitting evil exit for a man of his considerable stature. Suicide can also appear to be a business decision. There's some, again, the research for this, as you can imagine, is kind of peculiar. But uh, Alex C. battled the Inland Revenue, the IRS, for years at enormous cost. He explained his suicide to his wife in the following terms. This is the suicide now. I've taken my life in order to provide capital for you. The IRS, the IRS and its liens, which have been taken against our liens, it's taken against our property illegally by runaway agency of our government, have dried up all sources of credit for us. So I've made the only decision I can. It's purely a business decision. I hope you understand that. I love you completely. The same ambivalence here with the added kind of business decision aspect. Note here the conviction that no other decision is possible and the declaration of complete love. Alex C's hope was that his wife would receive the insurance money after his death. With unintended bathos, his note ends with the words, you will find my body on the lot on the north side of the house. Since the financial crisis of 2008, examples of such suicides are all too common. There's been a whole spate of mortgage suicides in Spain. There's been a large spate of workplace suicides in France. And I've got more um, examples of that. This is, I'll just read this out. But after, there was a story about suicide uh, rates that appeared in the Times on May the 2nd, 2013. And uh, in one of the comments, someone called Jen D from New Jersey wrote the following. I just thought this was an extraordinary moving moment. This is Jen D comments in the New York Times. Economic hopelessness. My brother committed suicide last July. He had just turned 60. He lost his IT job in the Great Recession of 2008. Despite hundreds of resumes being sent out and a lifetime of IT experience, he got few interviews and no, no job offers. He spent down his 401k, and when he died, the only thing he owned was a beat-up car. We later found out that he had a lot of credit card debt, with which he had tried to keep himself afloat. After four years of no job offers, unemployment running out, having no health insurance, etc., his dignity was shot. He'd lost hope of ever working again. How I wish he had not committed suicide. How I would give anything to have him back. I consider him one of the casualties of the recession. And when I read of the fat bonuses the banksters award themselves, I shake with rage that they've continued to prosper while people like my brother lost all hope and people like me lost a loved one. I don't want to comment on that, it just speaks for itself. But again, there's an awful lot more that could be said about that kind of aspect of this issue. In extreme cases, um, another phenomenon I want to get to now is suicide as homicide, and thinking that through a little bit. In, some, in extreme cases, um, suicide often merges with fantasies of victimization to devastating effect. The most infamous of these is the mass suicide of Jim Jones and the People's Temple in Guyana on November the 18th, 1978 where 918 people died, including 276 children. It was the largest number of Americans killed prior to 9-11. The children were forced to drink grape-flavored Kool-Aid laced with cyanide before their parents did the same. While hundreds of people were dying, Jim Jones gave a long sermon to the bizarre accompaniment of organ music. His persecutory fantasy 
was that the US government was going to destroy him and all his followers in reprisal for their murder of Leo Ryan, a US congressman who tried to visit their community on a government fact-finding mission. You can find this on YouTube if you've got the strength to do this. But Jones proclaims, if we can't live in peace, let's die in peace. We're not committing suicide, it's a revolutionary act. It's a revolutionary suicide council. I'm not talking about self-destruction, self I'm talking about that we have no other road. And it goes on like that. And all the while, the organ music kind of grinds on. It really is bizarre. What's so striking about the example of Jonestown is the complete disavowal of any responsibility for the act of mass death and the certainty that there's no other option. Once a decision is taken, always against one's will, there can be no other path of action. One delivers oneself up into the hands of fate. And that goes to an example, I don't want to go through the whole thing here, but it just, it's fascinating, gruesome, strange, and you know, compelling, and really revealing. It's the case of Elliot Roger. And um, on May the 24th last year, Elliot Roger, a 22-year-old student from Santa Barbara Community College, killed six people and injured 13 more before taking his own life in um, Isla Vista, California. And his suicide note took two forms. A long video shot in a couple of sunny locations in or beside his beautiful black BMW and a much longer 137-page manifesto called My Twisted World. I would urge you to watch the video, which is the very quintessence of narcissistic self-regard and avoid the text, which I had the misfortune to read in its entirety. Rogers characterizes what he calls his day of retribution in the following terms. Exactly my re retribution is my way of proving my true worth to the world. What I'm thinking about here is where this mixture of depression and exhibitionism finds expression in the revenge suicide note as a kind of contemporary phenomenon. Roger depicts himself as a brilliant torch of misunderstood hero whose suicide is not the expression of any free will, but a necessary act in order to avoid punishment after committing murder. In his manifesto, he recounts his life story in exhaustive and exhausting detail and documents the perceived difficulties he experienced because of his ethnicity. This is him. I'm half white and half Asian. And this made it different from the, me different from the fully white kids I was trying to fit in with. He describes himself as starved of sex and unable to attract girls, his word, not mine. His particular recurring obsession is with blonde women at his college. In July 2013, he went to a party and started a fight after seeing a young woman talk to a young Asian man. This is him again. How can an ugly Asian attract the, attract the, the attention of a white girl while a beautiful Eurasian like myself never gets any attention from them? In the fight, his leg is broken and he complains that not one girl offered to help me as I stumbled home with a broken leg, beaten and bloody. If girls had been attracted to me, they would have even offered to sleep with me to make me feel better. This is obviously this is this is a question of ethnicity here, it's also a question of misogyny, obviously, at play. He planned his day of retribution with great care and precision, while at the same time meeting with his psychiatrist, who was incredibly called Dr. Sophie, S O P H Y. Refusing the world of Sophie's philosophy. Rogers, Roger buys a bunch of handguns and ammunition, fantasizes about killing his stepmother and younger brother, and keeps delaying his date with destiny. The last paragraph of his manifesto reiterates his characterization of himself as the rightful actor and insists that his killing spree is the righting of wrongs. I am the true victim in all this. I am the good guy, he says. Humanity struck at me first by condemning me to experience so much suffering. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. Elliot Rodgers is an extreme example, I know, but it shows a highly elaborate, how a highly elaborate suicide note, both as video, the new version of the phenomenon, and manifesto, can culminate in a total absence of any moral responsibility. I am a victim. This is everyone else's fault. You are to blame. This is a just retribution for what you did to me. Suicide merges seamlessly with homicide, as a punishment for the wrongs perpetrated by one's parents, community, and society as a whole. Roger feels that the whole universe is against him, and this utterly vindicates his actions. What's so breathtaking throughout his manifesto is his unquestioned and unflinching sense of entitlement. 
And one thinks, of course, in connection with this, of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting on December the 14th, 2012, in Newtown, Connecticut. After shooting his mother, Nancy Lanza, with four gunshots to the head, Adam then used his mother's rifle. We're going to focus on this. He shot his mother first, then shot everybody else with his mother's rifle. To he broke into the school and killed 20 children and six adults before killing himself. All the children were aged between six and seven years old. Although the State of Connecticut report, released on November 25, 2013, was unable to show any clear evidence as to the motive for Lanza's actions, aside from an obsession with mass shootings, like the Columbine High School shootings of 1999, and playing assorted but widely available video games like Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto, I have an open question about the phenomenon of homicide suicide. Has a new and extreme form of suicide as homicide begun to emerge over recent years, where suicidal urges are increasingly being transformed into homicidal rampages? I guess only time will tell. Obviously, the, even the example which comes to mind most recently is the example of the German wings plane that went into uh, the French Alps and the, um, the case of um, Andreas Rubitz, I forget his name. So this, this idea of whether this question of suicide, homicide, is a new kind of scansion in this history, obviously 9-11 is something which is connected with this. Anyway, I'm trying to kind of think that through and um, think it out. No, you can skip that. Okay. Got about ten minutes. Fifth, how long have we got? Just fine. Is that okay? I'll again I'll skip over some stuff I'm not gonna go through, but just to give you a sense of where I'm trying what I'm trying to think through here. Um, I try to think about uh, a number of literary uh, figures of suicide. Uh, this man, this Edouard Levé book, Suicide, from a few years back, and that's uh, an extraordinary um, example. Um, it's a book that's written in the second person. It's a it's a book that's written. In the second one, addressed to um, a 25 year old man from the perspective of a 41 year old man. And the 25 year old man, seemingly inexplicably, um, after leaving his house to, to, to play tennis with his girlfriend, returns into the house, um, goes into the basement, picks up a gun, and shoots himself after opening up a comic book or a graphic novel at a certain page which was his suicide move. And Levé tries to work through this, this phenomenon of suicide and comes to, makes a series of really fascinating remarks. He says, for example, um, only the living seem incoherent. Death closes the series of events that constitute their lives. So we resign ourselves to finding a meaning for them. To refuse them, this would not be to accept would amount to accepting that a life and that a life is absurd. So yours have not yet attained the coherence of things done. Your death gave this coherence. So the point there is that the, the, the peculiar nature of suicide is that it grants coherence to a life retrospectively, whether it's uh, willed or not. Well, I'll come back to that thought in closing. I then go to two other, um, two other texts. Uh, Camus, uh, the myth of Sisyphus, and uh, Jean Améry, um, his uh, on work on suicide, which is, among, amongst other things, a, a critique of, of Camus and a defense of the a free act of suicide. But let me come to a kind of conclusion. <clears throat> Do plants commit suicide? Do animals die of hopelessness? We don't know. Moreover, if we put those questions to plants and animals, then we probably wouldn't understand their response. P. 
peak aphids when threatened by a ladybug can explode themselves, as can some species of termite. The Brazilian ant, Ferelius pusillus, engages in quasi-suicidal behaviour. Each night as the ant's nest is sealed, a number of ants remain outside to ensure that the seal is secure. They die before the nest is reopened the next morning. This is not so much suicide as self-sacrifice for the greater ant, aphid, or termite good. Perhaps it is the capacity for suicide to make the decision for voluntary self-destruction that picks us out as a species, that distinguishes us as human. Perhaps a suicide is a human being. This thought is picked up and pushed hard by one of the bleakest and most blackly humorous writers I know, the Roman, the Romanian philosopher and aphorist Ian Choran, Choran is the French thing. In A Short History of Decay, and one of the great things about Choran's titles of his books, in A Short History of Decay he writes, the man who has never imagined his own annihilation, who has not anticipated the recourse to the rope, the bullet, the poison, or the sea, is a degraded galley slave, or a worm crawling upon the cosmic carrion. The world can take everything from us, can forbid us everything, but no one has the power to keep us from wiping ourselves out. You get the flavor of the prose. To be human is to have the capacity at each and every moment of killing oneself. Incarceration, humiliation, disappointment, disease, the world can do all this to us but it cannot remove the possibility of suicide. For as long as we keep this power in our hands, then we are, in some minimal but real sense, free. Religions like Christianity prohibit suicide because of the threat of insubordination that it poses, the refusal of lord the lordship of king or god or church or state. Suicide, Shoran writes, is one of man's distinctive characteristics, one of his discoveries. No animal is capable of it, and the angels of skirt scarcely guessed its existence. Suicide, then, is like an oxygen tank from which we can breathe in a world that's become, in Hamlet's words, a prison. Shoran perversely concludes, without suicide, no salvation. So, is Churan counselling that we should kill ourselves? Not in the slightest. The idea that suicide is our salvation does not entail that we should try and save ourselves with the rope or the bullet. In All Gaul is Divided, one of those great titles. What's your new book? It's called All Gaul is Divided. He writes that only optimists commit suicide. The optimists who can no longer be optimists. The others having no reason to live, why should they have any to die? The others of whom Choran speaks here are the pessimists, among whom he counts himself. And here is the brilliance of this line of thought. There is finally something too optimistic about suicide, too positive and assertive, too caught up in the fantasy of salvation through death, revenge, and the rest. In the pleasingly entitled, The Trouble With Being Born, Choran writes, when people come to me saying they want to kill themselves, I tell them, what's your rush? You can kill yourself any time you like. So calm down. Suicide is a positive act. And they do calm down, he says. Perhaps we have to calm down and look at matters more soberly and more pessimistically, without giving in to optimistic delusions that our death would solve any kind of problem enact payback, revenge or retribution, save us from ourselves, from others, or, for the, or from the painful commotion of the world. In a delicious coup de grace, Choran writes, the refutation of suicide, reputation of suicide, colon, is it not inelegant to abandon a world which has so willingly put itself at the service of our melancholy? I find something grimly reassuring even fortifying in what we might call the inelegant refutation of suicide. Let's grant the capacity for suicide is what at least partially picks us out as a species. For as long as we're in possession of the powers of reflection and basic motility skills, we own the weapon with which we can assert our freedom and end our days, should we wish for such a consummation. We know that. But this does not entail that we should use that weapon, not at all. 
That would be far too optimistic an act. Nothing will be saved by our suicide. Why not calm down and enjoy the world's melancholy spectacle that spreads out so capaciously and delightfully before us? Why not linger a while in the face of what Nietzsche calls strict, hard factuality? Why not turn ourselves inside out, away from the finally hateful inward suffering and outwards and upwards towards others, not in the name of some right or duty, but instead out of love? Each of us has the power to kill ourselves, sure, but why not choose instead to give oneself to another or others in an act of love, to give what one does not have and to receive that over which one has no power, which is one way of defining love, to give what one does not have and to receive that over which one has no power. Why not attempt a minimal conversion away from the self-aversion that lacerates and paralyzes us towards another possible version of ourselves? Is this not finally more courageous? Such is perhaps what Nietzsche calls the pessimism of strength, as opposed to an optimism of naivety and weakness. True pessimists don't kill themselves. Is that not enough? In 1941, Virginia Woolf placed stones in her pockets and entered a river near her home in East Sussex in England, drowning herself, most Ophelia-like. Facing her fourth breakdown, complaining of hearing voices and terrified of another descent into madness, Wolf wrote to her husband, I can't fight it any longer. I know I'm spoiling your life. You see, I can't even write this properly. I can't read. What I want is to say that I owe you all the happiness of my life. I owe all the happiness of my life to you. And these words, Wolf's suicide note, um, are marked by the same ambivalence that we can find in many other of the notes that we've looked at intense self-hatred combined with this profound expression of love. But it's not the circumstances of Wolf's death I want to focus on. It's not Wolf's suicide that grants her life coherence, which is very often how Virginia Wolf is seen. That coherence is provided by the courage of her work and what she wrote about life. That matters much more. I want to read you, in closing, a, a passage which in many ways is the, the pretext for this whole taught is to read this passage out. <laughs> it's from To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. <clears throat> it's quite hard to read, so let's see if I get it right. As you probably notice, your course, Virginia Woolf sentences have a certain sinuous quality. Always, Mrs. Ramsey felt, one help oneself out of solitude reluctantly by laying hold of some little odd or end, some sound or some sight. She listened, but it was all very still. Cricket was over, the children were in their baths, there was only the sound of the sea. She stopped knitting. She held the long reddish brown stocking dangling in her hands a moment. She saw the light again, the light of the lighthouse, with some irony in her interrogation, for when one woke at all, one's relations changed. She looked at the steady light, the pitiless, remorseless light that was so much her, yet so little her, which had her at its beck and cool. She woke in the night and saw it bent across their bed, stroking the floor. But for all that she thought, watching it with fascination, hypnotized, as if it were stroking with its silver fingers some sealed vessel in her brain, whose bursting would flood her with delight. She had known happiness, exquisite happiness, intense happiness, and it silvered through the rough waves a little more brightly as daylight faded, and the blue went out of the sea, and it rolled in waves of pure lemon, which curved and swelled and broke upon the beach, and the ecstasy burst into her eyes, and waves of pure delight raced over the floor of her mind, and she felt, it is enough. It is enough. The topic of suicide immediately raises the following question. By virtue of what is or is not life meaningful? It might seem that if we cannot answer the question of life's meaning, then it would be prudent, perhaps even necessary, to exit life for whatever, God or the void or some mixture of the two. If we cannot find reasons to be, then it is perhaps better not to be. But that would be a huge mistake, a fatal misstep. The question of life's meaning is an error and should simply be given up. The great revelation will never come. 
The clouds will never part with the promise of salvation. Our minds will never stop rattling down through gutters of doubt, self-deceit, self-pity, and guilt. Instead of thinking a wolf again, there are little daily miracles, matches struck in the dark, the breaking waves, and Mrs. Ramsey saying, life, stand still here. Life, stand still here. When life stands still here, and we face the endless shifting in different grey brown seas, this was written in front of the sea, when we hold ourselves out into that indifference tenderly, without pining, self-pitying, complaining, or expecting some reward or glittering prize, that we might have become, just for that moment, something that has endured and will endure. Someone who can find some sort of sufficiency right here and right now. Ecstasy bursts into our eyes. It is enough. And that's quite enough for this <laughs> evening. <laughs> Simon, do you have enough energy left oh, for a few? Yeah, right. You're okay? For just yeah. we we can't do very many, but a few questions if people have them. Um, Yeah, suicide is contagion. We'll say some more about that. I mean, the, um, the imitation of. Yeah, there's a notion, um, especially working on college campuses, yeah. that if a student kills themselves, it's going to get permission to other people are thinking about it yeah. to cross the threshold. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, as a phenomenon, it's just true. I, mean, I, don't, I don't analyze it in the. But I did. Um, um, uh, and I got, I got someone to help me with uh, sociological or just recent events on in relation to suicide and sociological studies of suicide, which I don't really include in the material, but that is a distinct phenomenon. And it will be, and the, the contagion aspect is often related very clearly to exactly the same spot. And um, I mean, how we think that through is, how we think that through, but it, it, it's true, yeah. This, the, the Golden Gate Bridge example is kind of that. It's the, it, it seems in terms of the, you know, you know, um, if you read people like, you know, Kay Jameson and other people like that, you know, it's the, in terms of the internal phenomenology of suicide, the, the, there's a certain point where a decision is taken. And once that decision is taken, it's taken. And so you often find um, people that commit attempt, people that attempt suicide will repeatedly attempt suicide until they're successful. And, um, whatever we do with that. And the other thing we don't talk about, again, it's in the background for this, is the gender dimension of this, right? That three to four as, three to four as many women attempt suicide as men, and three to four as many men are successful in the suicide as women. And the methods are very different. 57% of male suicides in the US are firearms related. Women attempt suicide at a certain age, and it's usually uh, through forms of drugs, and you know, and that that's the case um, everywhere. I was able to find statistics are really um, unreliable, um, and many countries don't give them. Like Russia, which has a very high suicide rate, um, particularly in relation to alcohol. But the the one trend which seems to the one fact which seems to buck that trend is the phenomenon of female suicides in China which is often related to um, extreme poverty and uh, usually done through pesticide. What's so the very that? female suicide rate in China. One way back there and then another one here. Durkheim and I've, I've, I've read a lot of sociological material but again this this I mean my, my approach is again borrowing from 
Jean Emery's idea of introspection and empathy. So I've my methodological <coughs> schools are really to try and try and get inside the um, the head. Thank you. Right, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot to say about that. I mean, I, I haven't looked at that case, although I've, I know, you know, I know what you're talking about, and it's important. When I look at the case of Jim Jones and the, uh, the People's Temple in Guyana, this, isn't, this, is an, this is a revolutionary suicide council in that language. And it just seems to me that, you know, um, uh, the phenomena connected with that um, are more prevalent um, in the world, and our reaction to them is also more prevalent. Which government called IS a, a death cult the other day? I mean, it's, you know, so it's a death cult. Um, but you know, there's a sense in which the um, the question of um, of suicide, homicide, suicide as a, as, a, as a political act, has has undergone a, a transformation in a generation from in cases in Sri Lanka where the Tamil Tigers through to where we are now, where it's a kind of incredibly regular occurrence, and using one's body as a kind of weapon. Yeah, no, that's good, that's good. Also to talk about in this whole you know, literature on suicide by cop, right? There's all these cases of people, you know, attempting suicide, um, lock themselves in their houses and they're shot by the police. Um, that happens, that happens a good deal. The, um, not a good deal, it happens. Um, but the, I think it's, it's a deeply ambiguous phenomenon, this, you know, because uh, I think one thing I deal with in the the longer version of this um, is Mishima, uh, the death of Mishima, the suicide of Mishima, Harakiri, ritual suicide, which is his, is his attempt to save Japan and Japanese honor against the degradation of the, um, um, the post-war, of, of Japan after the Second World War. And um, yeah, his, his, his death then becomes an enactment uh, his revolutionary will, which ends in a very, very nasty way. So I think in, in terms of, you know, there's, there's something ambiguous about that. I'm not, yeah, so yes. Okay.
I mean, it's, it's, it's a good point. There is a, there is a, there is a tension there. I think that's right. I mean, I tried to twist that around by um, articulating that weakness as a kind of strength of the, you know, the, the final argument against suicide is in um, using using Churan, that there's a kind of um, a delusion of salvation there. But am I implicitly repeating, as it were, the moral judgment on suicide? As I, as I close it, I think it's a question. And what I didn't, again, I skipped over this, but I looked at, um, you know, there are just, I mean, for example, a famous example, uh, George Eastman, the founder of Eastman Kodak, um, was in intense pain caused by a disorder affecting his spine. On March the 14th, 1932, he shot himself in his heart. And his, his, uh, his, his note was, to my friends, my work is done, why wait? And, and, or again, Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, football season is over. No more games, no more bombs, no more walking, no more fun, no more swimming. 67, 17 years past 50, 17 more than I needed or wanted. Boring. I'm always bitchy. No fun for anybody. 67, you're getting greedy. Act your old age. Relax. This won't hurt. <laughs> and with those examples, you have a sense in which that's, that's a more difficult thought. You know, uh, there is a kind of. Uh, I mean, I, Yes, yeah, so I, I take your point. And also, I didn't talk, and again, this isn't so much a thing that happens here, but in, in Britain, <coughs> uh, the, um, um, the amount of people that go to Dignitas in, in Zurich uh, uh, for assisted suicide, and, um, and the cases, uh, I mean, the, the, the courage that's involved in that is caused by intense pain very often, obviously. and. Uh, and there's, off, there's, a, there's a, yeah, so I, I try to think about that, but maybe there is a, a problem with the ending I, I'm not entirely happy with. It. To be brutally honest. <laughs> yeah. I Speaking like the Virginia Woolf quote, but I'm not sure. Speaking of gender, who always dies? Well, let's, let's, let's change that. Let's change that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Which um, uh, rely on an idea of nonviolence mm -hmm. uh, and counterpose it to the violence of you know, imposed by the state mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and defy that with a violence done to one's own body, but which mm -hmm. is nonviolent in certain ways. Yep. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, that would be a different kind of whatever category, but yeah. And you know, I'm very interested. Interested is the wrong word. I'm very, um, uh, I'm fascinated with um, <clears throat> uh, mysticism, <laughs> and in particular with mystical practices of um, self-violence, which are, which are very common. You know, there hasn't really been a we don't just have like, mystical intuitions, it's usually related to forms of self-violation, which somehow are linked to the visions, such as the visions are. And in many ways, the, the Tibetan example is a kind of pushing of that all the way. And if you think about the, um, the, the, the literature of female Christian uh, mysticism, which I, I know a little, it's, it's, it's very often at the point of death, or the point of absolute violation of, of oneself that this act of love is released. Julian of Norwich, for example. The first book written in English by an Englishwoman. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus Sorry. marches revelations. Yeah, people don't Sorry, let me let me just um in, no a small question. Don't go away. No, no, no. I'm actually wondering, um, we know quite a lot um, very recently, not because it's more common but more visible, about young men um, committing suicide in a lot of the prisons right yeah. now. Right? And we don't know much, or maybe you do. Um, we know I mean, that seems to me a quintessential um, act of, homicide, of, of suicide that is homicide, and that is, is a declaration of that it is a homicide, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. well, what about women in prisons? Yeah, I don't know. Does anybody know? I don't have the stats on that. I haven't read anything on that. I mean, there's very little published mm -hmm. about it. There's yeah. mostly it's on young men. Yeah. And I was yeah. Anybody know? At the back. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death for people who are released from prison, but in prison often it is against the rules, of course, that they commit suicide. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's kind of irrelevant. <laughs> Anybody else know anything about this question? It's a very interesting question. Uh, I'll, I'll. Well, okay, one more question. Yeah, please. I'm happy to go. Oh, you're happy, okay. I'm, not, I'm fine, okay. I'm feeling all right. Okay. Uh, so I, Oh, nice. it, it seems to echo sure about something that's, you know, uh, it's kind of, I, I, uh, kind of like almost like an apex of uh, aesthetics and continental thought. So this, this kind of marvel at being is it, and it is enough. Um, that Newton says, you know, the paradox is difficult with the very fact that it appears at all, that Newton ends up um, taking his own life. He loses a life and nothing more. Right. Yeah, and that's, his, his, his suicide is a very complicated one because this would be one interpretation of that which I've given is that the, you know, the defenestration of the self self defenestration of Deleuze. What was he, what did he die? What's, the, what's it called? The um, emphysema, right? It was an attempt in a way to breathe. And it's very common in cases of emphysema that there are people walked on the ground level because people are, they want to finally fill their lungs, right? So according to the other's way. Yeah, and there's also the story that, um, which circulated immediately after Deleuze's death, for which I found no empirical confirmation, but I still like it. He was listening to David Bowie, oh, okay. endlessly, uh, the man who sold the world. What could be the man who sold the world? If you were in, in bad taste mode, but the man he was listening to the Bowie album over and over again uh, yeah. prior to that, which kind of. Well, it's like you keep going with the stock. Yeah, but the, the, the way I don't raise it is that the which we find. We find, you know, distasteful, peculiar, odd, but we have to think about is also the aesthetics of that, the aesthetics of suicide. And um, in particular, I mean, course. okay, so for I mean, Adorno also, his utopian vision is literally just sitting at the sky, uh, or sitting, laying on water, sitting at the sky, being nothing more. He has a beautiful thing where he says, yeah. you know, uh, uh, the promise of the dialectic falling back to its origin. But I mean, it's really, it's really good that you bring up this thing where the loose, the guy who wants to say that you know creativity is the very thing that can break out of the kind of deadlock of you know desires repetition Final is life listening life. on repeat to, to David Bowie and this this is something I want to <laughs> like if you'll just let me go for a minute more on this kind of tangent here to kind of try and come back to this kind of this ultimate stillness which is you also find in Gambin as well I mean Gambin is he, he almost arrives at this kind of this, this nihilism that is yeah, highly set aside. And I wonder, I wonder if we can look at suicide in a way that we can, I don't know, not end on this kind of reframe of aesthetics, because I think it's a very dangerous reframe. And maybe if I can channel Eugene Bakker or channel Brady. You can channel Eugene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the lights will darken um, if I channel him. But, um, okay, I'll be, I'll be very, very quick. But the thing is, it's Virginia Woolf. Uh, right? Not to learn. Not agony. But so, no, so, it's not. A, it, it's it's something which she does. She does through a certain movement of prose, right? in a way that I think um, linguistically outdoes all of those other examples through a cultivation of the particular. That's 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 what it's Mrs. Ramsey in that moment looking at the lighthouse. That's where it. <clears throat> and I don't want to. I did, but I don't want to theorize that too much. I want to let that sit. But this brings us back to like people like, I mean, okay, what I want to say.
page here, and I'll just leave it, is there is this kind of strain of thinking which will say that there is this aesthetic that is, you know, the real, the on language. You know, we can touch it, but you know, ultimately it's it really is this it's 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 beyond us. And you have know, people like thinkers like Zizek who will say, you know, no, like we actually can't we actually we actually can't kind of dissipate ourselves into this. Uh, we have all we can do is kind of recoil absolutely back into ourselves. But the, just the one the one thing I want to is when it comes to trauma, which is maybe like the zero level of, of suicide, there's, there's suicide when you're faced with death, but there's also suicide when you're, um, you know, faced with just absolute meaninglessness. Is there a way that maybe we can kind of uh, stop, stop treating, you know, that in this, this case as though, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, mis, a mistaken kind of, they have a mistaken view of reality and they just, you know, look at the other way, it'll be meaningful, and rather maybe see that this is kind of a zero level of that you know, this might actually be kind of like an ontological blind spot that we haven't really taken very seriously. Um, and if, if we can stop, if we can. The answer is and yes. Uh, and is yes. yes, we can. <laughs> one, more <question. laughs> one, more yes. one more question, please. Well, then, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I uh, watched your YouTube uh, lecture at Durham University oh, right. before I came here, yeah. uh, and I noticed something that repeated itself in this lecture yeah. too. Uh, I'm saying this in relation to the inhibition that you talked about, yeah. and specifically the moral Christian metaphysical inhibition yeah. that you talked about. Uh -huh. In both that lecture and in this lecture, uh, you stop right after the intro section, yeah. and you say, I'm not going to talk about this. You mentioned that your interest in this question is not purely academical, no. and then you switch to a different uh, topic. Yeah. In that lecture, you also completely changed your voice. Uh, you whispered, I'm not going to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> and when you talked about your um, refusal, your inability, or your inhibition, yeah. uh, you were like, again, with a very, very low voice. Well, uh, yeah. What is it there that, you know, that doesn't yeah. respond well to that space yeah. that you want to get through some language? bad shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Question for me. It's a question that one grapples with at moments of one's life and in relationship to people that one loves, right? And um, um, there was something else you said which I always pick up. Oh, Durham. Yeah, Durham's great. So, Durham, uh, you know, university. Um, this is England for you, you know. Um, the, you know, I had, you know, suicide, whatever, and the. Um, the um, university counselling service called the the college and say, you know, talk, we're worried about this. <laughs> and then several of the local churches called uh, David Held, who's, the, who's mm -hmm. the person responsible for this, and saying, you know, they're really well. And they all turned up on the night, the counselling people, people from the church. Um, and that, it seems to me, is... Um, uh, a peculiar uh, relation to suicide in the sense that it, it's, you know, in relation to universities, there is a legal duty of care that um, universities have towards their students, which explains the kind of terror of suicide. But this was a kind of much more um, kind of sort of blanket students, you know, to try and make sure that they didn't think the wrong thoughts. And that strikes me as, uh, as really problematic. Because, and you know, and the the so you know we got away with it and it was okay, but the um, the inhibition and the, and the rage that uh, people feel in relationship to this and the the way in which um, again suicide has a kind of traumatic response in the sense in which we end up saying the same kind of thing all the time. It happens, we say something, time passes, it happens again, we say the same kind of thing. And that's just, it seems to me, hugely problematic. It's the um, ninth highest cause of death in the world. In the West, it's growing pretty dramatically. And you know, one thing is, is for sure, there's going to be a, a huge increase in uh, suicide rates in, in the West. Um, amongst baby boomers in the next 20 odd years. 
And we don't really have a, a vocabulary for thinking that through. I'm not, whether it's right or wrong, good or bad, or whatever, we, 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 we fall into this language of rights and duties, and then we fall back into this, this language of offense, whose source is really uh, Christianity. At least in uh, southern legal arrangements. Again, a thing that I haven't looked into, which I want to look into, is the the way this is framed in uh, um, Islamic countries. I don't think you answered. Hmm. I think that the same inhibition is still at work. Yeah. Uh, because I asked you why. What is what is it that you were hiding then, and that you were hiding now? So you said in Durham there was the blanket, okay, fine, but is it, is it still here? Is there a legal reason why you're hiding it? What do you think I'm hiding? Well, there is, you stop at some point, you say, I'm not going to read this, then you say this is oh, a, right. that's just, an that's academic kind of matter for me, and then you just, and you skip over the same part. Personal shit. You know? <laughs> well, why don't you say personal shit? You're trying to create a it's space it, to, it, create it, to create it, a language. If one makes a judgment in public, I don't, it's better read than spoken. <laughs> because in Durham you said if there were less people, then you would read it. Well, it's like, you know, so so may, I, may I thank Simon for <laughs> producing... <laughs> may I thank him for producing this, this concert and not disappointing. <laughs>